All right, Trisha, how are you today? I'm doing well, Jeff. How are you? I am super pumped after the conversation we just had. I am still all up in my head. I don't think I've had time to really let it sink in of everything that just hit me. Uh, because number one, I'm not a gamer. Like I stopped gaming at like duck hunt. <laughs> and so I'm not a gamer. And here we are talking about esports and trying to understand the power that this has. But here's what I want us to think about. I want you to be open to today's conversation. If you don't know anything about gaming, if you're like me and your last game was duck hunt, uh, I want you to be open to an industry that is taking the world by storm. And I, I really want us to just be open as educators on what are the possibilities that we might be shutting down that we don't even know we're shutting down in our, in our, we don't even know we're doing it, but we might be shutting down pathways for students in our classrooms today. And I know I just, we talked about what the opening was going to be and then I totally didn't do it, but I'm just all up in my head and I don't know. It's just a, it's such a great way. I think this mini series we're having on esports of just thinking about what are we missing and how do we support kids? And I think esports is just part of that. Yeah. And it's, you know, if you've got a student who's really into gaming or there's a game they're really passionate about, I think anytime a student is being vulnerable and sharing a passion with us, it's an opportunity for us to build on that learning and to expand and to help them get curious about what might you do with that interest? And today's guest, that's you know essentially what she does for her career and for a I living, think the yeah. entire – that's what she does for a living. And it's a, a reminder of, again, how can we help students follow those interests and see where they may lead? So I'm going to tell folks a little bit about today's guest. Um, but Jeff, I think you've done a good headline of, yes, this is part of our eSports miniseries – but today's conversation is very much relevant for any teacher of any subject because, yeah. again, we're going to look at how far and wide does this industry go. So we're very fortunate today to have with us the CEO at Women in Games International. This is Joni Kraut. For 15 years, Joni has operated in tech and gaming within different verticals throughout her career. She's also a seasoned speaker uh, who speaks on a whole variety of topics, including the advancement of women in leadership. She's an advocate for equality and was recognized as the 2019 Cal CPA Woman to Watch in Finance and Accounting Experience Leader Award for her significant contributions to the profession and her community. She's, again, been on a lot of different lists. She was also named one of the top 50 women leaders of Los Angeles of 2023 by Women We Admire. When you head over to the show notes, you're going to be able to learn much more about Joni as well as her nonprofit organization, Women in Games International. So Jeff, I know you've been mind blown by this, this conversation, but just to, again, let listeners know what they are in for, what was sort of a shifted thought that you left our conversation with? So I think today, I think the, the shifted thought for me is the power of community. And we understand as educators, specific, especially in the K-12 space, I and mean, everybody understands this, that community is so important. It's so important for belonging. It's so important to building skills, to understanding how do you communicate with others, uh, I think there's just so much we can do. And, and she does a great job. Joni does such a great job of talking about that idea of playing sports in school. And I love this. She, she talks about, you know, playing sports in school. It's not just about playing the sports. Very few people who play sports go on to be NFL players or NBA basketball players, or whatever, right? That is a, that's like less than 1% of people ever, ever make it as a career. But there's so many other things that you learn in playing sports. As somebody who played sports, clear through college, right? The ability to make teams, to lead teams, to be the raw, raw person. And at the same time, know that you need to step back and let other people lead. There's so many things that you learn in playing sports and the esports community is very much the same thing. If we have esports in our schools, how are we supporting kids in understanding? How do you create relationships in a community? How do you move forward as one? How are you inclusive in everyone? And I think we really... The thing that just, I think, blows my mind more than anything in this conversation is her passion about being inclusive. 
this idea of there are women gaming tournaments and boy gaming and, you know, men gaming tournaments or boy tournaments and girl tournaments. And she's really big and an advocate for saying like, no, there just needs to be a tournament. We need to stop segregating and we need to be more inclusive. And I think that's such a great message for all of us. And I know in schools, that's what we're doing. We're trying to be more inclusive in everything we do. And what if esports is the community that we can really foster inclusivity? That's number one. Number two, the thing I think that comes out, she talks about her story growing up and not having access to, to, to technology to even know that these things were available. I've said it once, and I will continue to say this with every school that I work with. Technology is an equity issue. We need to have programs like this in our school so that students have the access to be able to understand what they have in front of them. I was just working with a school district last week who we were talking about this. They are a very rural school district. They have students who live where there is no cell phone access, where there is no internet. The only place that these students would ever have access to know that there is such a thing as chat GPT, or there's such a thing as esports. that these are pathways and programs that other kids, the only place that these kids have access to that is in the school. When we talk about equity in school, we have to be talking about equity access via technology. It's a, it's an equity issue. And I think that comes through in today's, um, today's conversation as well is how are we making sure that we are equitable in what we're allowing students to do? And I think the last thing, and it's still blowing my mind because again, I'm not in it. I don't know. It's an entire industry. <laughs> this esports thing is an entire industry. Like there's scholarships at the university level. And even here at community colleges, you can get a scholarship to go into esports at community college. And you start thinking about, okay, well, these are pathways for kids to go to university and have a full ride scholarship in some kind of esports capacity. And so I think it's just this idea of there's a community out there. And to your point, please don't skip this episode because you're just like, I don't want to learn about esports. It's important for us to know, even if it's not your thing, right? It's not going to be my thing. I'm not in, I, I am not, I, I loved my duck hunt and I'm done. I don't own a gaming system. I'm all right. But it's important for us to be open to these conversations and understand where our students are spending time and making sure that we're preparing them for their future and not our past. And I know that's really long-winded, but it, it's so important for us to have these conversations, to be thinking about what is being said and what am I doing in my classroom to support this and making sure that I'm not just shutting down kids when they say, when I grow up, I want to be a gamer. I think that's the biggest thing that I get out of today's episode. All right. And with that, here is Joni, the CEO of Women in Games International, talking about everything that they provide and support in the gaming industry. And with that, on with the show. Thank you so much again for sharing all of your expertise and insight. Joni, as CEO at Women in Games International, you have a very unique perspective on the role that esports can play in communities. I'm wondering if we can start off our conversation with you telling listeners about how you initially became interested in esports and how the work that you do is creating just so many different future pathways for young folks who are also interested in a potential future career in the esports industry. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I kind of accidentally fell into esports. So I started off uh, working as a newspaper reporter and I was really interested in just kind of using stories and um, kind of collecting data along the way to to create a, a narrative to get facts out there. Um, I mean, in writing stories, it was it was one of those creative places where there was no right or wrong, it was always kind of this gray area of some people like your writing, some people don't. Um, and I, I craved that like needing to be right kind of piece to mm. my career. Uh, and so I actually started leaning into the data piece. And so um, I actually switched into accounting and, and data analysis. And so uh, in getting more into the economic side of things and um, just wanting to use that data that a lot of people found to be really overwhelming to tell stories and to predict the future and to um, create a, a narrative that other people might miss just by looking at a huge spreadsheet. Uh, and so it was sort of through that that I ended up really leaning into tech and, and finance. And I, a lot of times I was the kind of that bridge between the tech team and the finance team where, you know, the tech team wanted to move forward with the new innovative 
platform or idea and the accounting team was still sort of used to the paper and pencil aspect of, of recording. Uh, and so how do we marry these two together? And so sort of speaking to the two teams and understanding that, you know, maybe the finance team can't see why the technological piece was important, but the tech team can't understand where the analysis piece is, is getting lost in the in the jumble of the platform and, and really pushing forward with that new innovative idea. Um, sort of created this like FinTech piece before FinTech was cool. Um, <laughs> and I ended up uh, with a lot of different tech companies and, and working with them to help them m mitigate their platforms and, and move to new uh, new ways of reporting and, and recording data. And so um, with that, I ended up at Motorola and there was a, a group of guys that I would hang out with at lunch and they had just come off of the uh, like the 05, 06 kind of uh, breakdown of the esports industry. And so they ended up at a full-time job at, from a, a really cool, exciting esports job. And we would just kind of talk about like, what do you mean you used to play video games for a living? What do you mean you used to go to these conferences where people would just play video games? This is so mind blowing and so amazing. And so just kind of talking to them about their experiences. And um, I was at a point in my career where I really wanted to care about my job. <laughs> I really <laughs> wanted to move up in my career but I just wasn't passionate about the work that I was doing. And I had a mentor at the time who said, what is the one thing that gets you up out of bed every morning? What is the one thing that makes you so excited? What is the thing that, you know, keeps you moving forward? And I was just like, my mouse, I really, <laughs> really loved my mouse. Uh, it was like butter on a warm pan. It was just my favorite thing that I'd ever used. I was playing Warcraft at the time and it was kind of, I thought it was gonna be a very gimmicky thing to get a Warcraft mouse, but it was the best mouse I'd ever had. And so she said, well, who makes the mouse? Because that's gonna be your people. That's gonna be the people who are passionate about making this product are gonna be your people, go find these people. Uh, and I got home and I looked because I had no idea. I was like, I don't know what Thrall makes. I have no idea who would make my mouse. Uh, and it was Steel Series. And so I ended up applying for a job. And it was one of those things that was just kind of like fate has it. You know, I was living in Chicago. They were right down the street. They were like 10 minutes away from my house. Um, they had an accounting position open. They were looking at expansion. They were looking at analysis of the different areas that they were trying to get into. I had this, you know, economics and, and kind of data background and it was just a perfect fit. It was amazing. And so I got to work with this this company and that was working with esports teams to develop products to make sure that they could continue to win. And so they were really listening and talking to and working with and partnering with these esports teams. So I had the opportunity to meet different people and um, even to go to like different events and, and just kind of be in that space and understand what esports really was. And it was so much more than just playing a video game and making mm. money. Um, it was it was the competition. It was the camaraderie. It was, you know, that 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 feeling when you go to a, a big event and, and having that, you know, that group of people that you're cheering with, it was, it was so powerful and it was so amazing and um, kind of never looked back from there. So I've been within uh, esports and gaming since then, just helping with nonprofits and startups and helping people kind of figure out the financial side of things when it comes to starting up a new company, uh, monetization strategies, and then expansion and economics and, and kind of pulling in that data analytic as well. So it was, it was sort of accidentally that I fell into esports, but I just loved it so much I stayed <laughs> as much as I could within there. Um, so now at Wiggy, that was you know one of the biggest things for me was was finding Wiggy and you know going to some of these conferences in the beginning of my career. It was this this genuine interest and this genuine you're here. Why are you here? Are you someone's girlfriend or are you someone's sister? And it mm. wasn't necessarily malicious. It was a confusion of, you mean you're really interested in CSGO? You're really interested in this game? You're interested in this competition? And um, and sure, there were, you know, there were times that it was malicious, but there, it was mostly a genuine curiosity and an excitement that that more people were kind of interested in, in kind of jumping into the scene. So um, I would never, ever try to be a professional gamer. That's not something that has ever been in my cards, which is fine, but there's so many new opportunities to get into the industry. And so that's kind of where we're focused at Wiggy is creating those opportunities to, to see those extra spaces and see and understand all of the pathways into esports and gaming. So, you know, everything from a lawyer to a chiropractor, to um, a data analyst, to economics, to just every single pathway into esports, it's a full industry and it's not just pro players being amazing. Um, there's owners and, and, and there's so many different aspects. And so um, that's kind of how we're trying to pull in more DEI is just show those opportunities and create access to those opportunities. Well, I love that your story was accidental because I think it's a perfect example of just 
you know, we're hearing more and more that it's very common for people to have multiple jobs in a career and be having pivots within an industry. And, you know, part of why we wanted to invite you on was really to help teachers understand the esports industry is, as you said, we're not just talking about professional gamers. That's one aspect of many, 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 many multiple uh, avenues. And I love that you came into it and now your work is really helping others make their pathway too. Um, and I know we're going to talk about the role of mentorship that uh, that your organization plays, but um, that's a great, a great story and a great reminder. If you're a teacher of business or economics or entrepreneurship, like what a great industry to look at. Um, so, so thanks for sharing that personal journey with us. Yeah. And I mean, as the CEO of Women in Games International, can you maybe talk a little bit more about what, what do you do? What is kind of your mission and your vision over there? And how are you uh, just, what, 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 what kind of things do you, what doors do you help open for others? Absolutely. So, um, so I grew up very poor. So I grew up in a trailer court in the middle of a cornfield in Illinois. And so access to opportunity and access to resources was very, very limited for me. Uh, when I wanted to use a computer, I would have to ride my bike to the library. Um, and, and it was, it was also the idea that if I broke the library computer, I don't really know what that would even cost. So I, I kind of steered away from sort of technology in general, to be honest. Um, and I would use the school computer and I would use the library computer, but that was that was sort of it. Uh, when I got to college, I realized that computers were essential. Um, and so I, I had to get a computer and I had to take a computer course to understand how to use it. And my I had a friend at the time who was just like, you're, you're taking this too analytical. You need to gamify this. You need to understand a computer, but you need to understand it in a way that you're gonna relate to it. And so, uh, I started playing Warcraft. They introduced me to World of Warcraft. Mm. And through playing Warcraft, I had to learn how to troubleshoot. I had to learn how to make sure it wasn't going to overheat during a raid. I had to, and as a healer, that's very important. Um, <laughs> I had to kind of make sure that I understood all the nuances. I had to stop clicking ignore when I had an update, um, which is still something I struggle with today. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's kind of that idea that, you know, technology is is very important, but also getting used to those different aspects of what's important to each career, in each, each field uh, is going to help empower you. You. Um, so when we, you know, talk to younger kids, especially if, if you're in kind of a low income or underserved area, it's hard to think through your next five years mm. when you're not sure where your next meal is coming from. It's right. hard to think about your career goals when your your real goal is just to get out of where you're at. And so um, it, it's sort of creating those conversations with people who are in the industry, who are trying to get into the industry, or who are just kind of interested in the industry and showing them all the different pathways and opportunities. So when we look at esports, we recently took uh, our mentees from our Get in the Game program. Uh, our Get in the Game program is a program that is specifically designed to help women who otherwise couldn't afford it the opportunity to go to a games industry conference. And we cover the cost of a flight, a round trip flight, a uh, hotel, a per diem, um, even the, the travel to get from your house to the airport and from the airport to get to the hotel wow. is completely covered. We don't want this to cost you anything, but we want it to really help you propel your career. Mm. So we give them business cards and we, we have very actionable workshops and mentorship coaching sessions with them. Uh, and we, we teach them how to introduce themselves and how to make that an actual introduction. So what is your name? And don't give me options. If your name is Kim or Kimberly or Kimmy, tell me what you want me to call you. Mm. Just one name so I can remember your one name. What do you want to be known as? And then what is the point of this conversation? And when we have these actionable you know, introductions and we go around the table and we constantly make them do it and they groan every time, they're like, oh, I don't want to do this again. Uh, but then when they go to actually do it at a conference, they can start to open the door for themselves. It's mm. not us constantly needing to open that door for them. And so empowering somebody to empower themselves is the biggest thing that we're trying to do with our mentorship programs. Uh, when we went to DICE, we took them to the HyperX Arena here in Vegas and we did a tour. And, you know, we had a couple mentees that were like, I don't really know anything about esports. I'm not really interested in esports. By the end of the tour, every single one of them was like, I could go into esports at this pathway with this pathway mm, or with this pathway. They were cool. so excited. They were ready to go. We had a content creator who was like, I could be a shoutcaster. I could be an observer. Mm. I could be on this side of the desk. Uh, and it was, it was just a really cool opportunity to see, you know, it's so much more than just the the pro player, which is obviously a hugely important person. Uh, but you know, there's there's three different levels of production. There's the camera person. There's you know team owners. There's there's so many other ways into the industry. So um, the biggest thing that we focus on with our mentorship is not just showing the different pathways in, but then 
creating an opportunity for you to learn more about each of those those pieces. So a tournament tournament organizer is very different than somebody who's running production. Um, both jobs are incredibly important. But if you're looking at event planning, a tournament organizer might be your jam. And mm. so if you don't even know that that's an opportunity that exists, if you go into marketing because you think you like, um, you want to we have a lot of people that think they want to be a community manager. And then the more we talk to them, we're like, you don't want to be a community manager. You want to tell a story about a brand. Mm. You want to be the person who's running the brand and who's driving that story and driving that narrative, uh, which is very different than a community manager who's just kind of talking to the community and engaging with the community. So it's creating those access points and those opportunities to also learn more about each of the positions that are within the industry as well. Um, and we were talking about, you know, there's so many different pathways that a lot of teachers don't see as well. Um, I do have three kids. And so my oldest is 16 and he's now running us through raids when I used to run through raids with him when we were pregnant. Huh. And so there's, there's just a lot of um, learning. There's a lot of evolution that's constantly coming. And it's it's still a young industry, although it's been around for a while. It's it's considered young compared to other industries. So there's still so many new opportunities. You know, instead of trying to fit yourself into a specific category or a specific title, figuring out what it is that you love and then creating that opportunity within esports to create a career, tell the, tell the company why they need you, tell them what it is that you can do for their brand, tell them what it is that you can do for them within esports and create that new role is, is a huge opportunity. Um, and we're constantly seeing that there's a, there's a ton of new roles that it, even in the last five years have, uh, you know, just kind of manifested and, and through people just saying, Hey, if I was here, I could be doing X, Y, and Z for you. So um, there's, there's a lot of mentorship that goes into showing people that, you can become whatever it is that you want to become within esports and gaming. Uh, and if you just know how to introduce yourself, if you just know how to self advocate, if you just know how to uh, create that conversation and create that opportunity for yourself. So here's one of the things I want to just break this down because this, I think, for teachers is really, really important. For teachers, for parents, when we talk about esports, it's much like the same thing that we talk about. And I'm just going to use the NFL because most people can relate to, you know, the National Football League here in America. Here's the thing, right? Not everybody can be a quarterback. And what it takes to actually run a team is a ton of different aspects. You know, like you said, you have a team owner. But we have kids. We already have pathways at universities to become sports medicine Right. Students who don't want to be the quarterback, but they want to be the person on the sideline helping the quarterback, being able to go through physical therapy. These sports all have when you start thinking about any kind of sports, uh, I guess, just affiliation. There are so many different avenues. What I want parents and teachers to understand is when we talk about esports, we are talking about a whole industry, not just the kids who are sitting there playing games. Yes, that's part of it. You can be a professional gamer. You can be a quarterback. You can be a wide receiver. There is that part. But there's a lot of other jobs inside this industry, just like there is with every other sport. There's so many different avenues in. Do not shut down kids because they say, when I grow up, I want to be in esports. And the only thing you have in your mind is great. You're sitting around playing video games for 10 hours a day. And I just want people to understand that's what we're talking about. In July, this is just blows my mind, right? In July, your keynote at the National Association of Collegiate Esports. For people that understand, this is like NCAA basketball only for esports. <laughs> now think about that for a second. We all saw up in March and watch March Madness. And just think about what does it take to pull off March Madness, right? Every team has a social media person. Every team has the guy that's out there picking up basketballs and like, and all of those same jobs in different ways are also in the esports, in the esports arena. And that's where I, we have to understand this is a whole entire new industry that I think we are ignoring in K-12. I think we are trying to push kids away from it. I think very many people don't understand it. And when we don't understand something, we just say, hey, stop it. It's like when like five years ago when kids would say, hey, when I grew up, I want to be a YouTuber. And I had all these teachers going, yeah, right, you do. And now people are making money creating YouTubes and TikToks and Instagrams, right? Like It's just we have to understand that the world is changing and there's new things coming around us. So here's one of the things I want to ask. Number one. What are the ages of your mentees? Like, are, do you get down into middle school, high school, or are these, uh, are these women or people in college and afterwards? 
So our, our community is really interesting in that we're all the way from 18 to 75. Okay. So we're everybody trying to get into the industry all the way up to people who have post-retirement are now trying to reach up and, and pull up the next generation. Okay. Um, we do usually try to stay above 21 for most of our events just because a lot of networking events sure. do involve alcohol. And we just don't want to put anybody in a situation. Sure. Um, but uh, our, normally our virtual mentorship program is, is usually about 18 and up. Okay. Now I want to focus in on your keynote. <laughs> uh, congratulations, by the way, to be able to keynote uh, the National Association of Collegiate Esports this summer. But right now, as you're kind of preparing for that keynote, can you maybe talk about what are some of the key themes that you're hearing in the industry right now? What are some of the topics or questions that we as, as educators in K-12 need to be aware of that you're going to be standing on stage? Here's the future. How do we start preparing students even earlier to prepare for these jobs that you can make money at, you know, within, within a different industry? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and I've been working a lot over the last few years with, um, with Cal State University. And so it was creating that collegiate level of, of interest and in, in trying to find ways and pathways. And like you, you mentioned, you know, football, um, or if any sport, really any, you know, football, basketball, if you play a sport in college, it's that camaraderie, it's that team, it's that coming together, it's that teamwork, it's that ability to work and, and get a project done. It, and that's really what you take away most of the time from college sports, because even, you know, like you said, so not true. everybody can be a quarterback. Not everybody goes on to a professional right. level of of playing that sport. It, esports is the exact same thing. So it's coming together with a bunch of, like, to be completely honest, we're a bunch of nerds. We're all just kind of coming together to play video games. Um, it's, it's probably a lot of theater kids that are super awkward and, and we're just <laughs> all kind of, you know, trying to shoutcast and, and have a good time. Uh, and so it's, it's creating that pathway by having the same facility, by mm. having a football field, by having a basketball right. court. So we're creating these esports facilities within these colleges. So you can see everything from, you need to get partnerships. Partnerships is a huge piece in esports. You have to get the partnership to get the money so we can run the tournament. If we don't have a sponsor for this tournament, we can't run it. College doesn't just have money to throw at tournaments. Yeah. So it's it's finding the right partnership. It's it's production. It's you know um, it's getting the team set up. It's designing the, the jerseys. It's designing the you know the the, the layouts and, and the logos and, and having all of those pieces coming together and seeing it real time and then having that that feeling like I created this. Uh, it, it's so many people coming together and so at the collegiate level we're seeing that and it's. it's really important. Um, one thing is, is creating that opportunity. Uh, another big thing is people are trying to get more diversity involved. And so they're having women's only events. But when you create a space for only women, you're you're reiterating that there's a space for women mm. and there's a space for men. Uh, and that does two things. Number one, it shows that you are supporting that men and women should be separate. Yeah. And number two, you're showing that there's only a space for men and women. Mm. And so then people start to bring in non-binary or um, gender fluid or, you know, where do trans people fit in? And, and there's so many extra conversations. Why can't we have one space promoting everybody? So when you it. have that major tournament or that major conference or that major space that you're showing esports as this platform, make sure that you have at least two people who are non-men on those panels. Make mm. sure that you have at least a 50-50 split of, you know, men, women, and, and then also having, you know, non-binary, gender fluid, having all of the diversity in one space and promoting it as one group. And you're promoting esports. You're not promoting one gender. You're not promoting one team. You're not promoting one specific, you're promoting esports and you're promoting that opportunity and access to that opportunity. That's another huge thing. When we have women's only events, we, when we have women's only boards, when we have women's only panels, and then it's the women don't want to come because they feel very separated. The men don't want to come because they feel like they're not welcome. And so nobody's ending up coming. And then people are going, well, I guess women just aren't interested in esports. Mm. It's not true. Creating that representation in front of everyone, create create the representation of women in front of the male players. It's, it's a huge opportunity. It's a huge token to normalizing women in esports. Um, and then number three, the biggest thing we're seeing right now is we have this access and opportunity within college. And there's so many girls going, I wish I knew this was going to be a pathway. I might have taken that one course in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're seeing a huge drop off rate. When we look at K-12, we're seeing the biggest drop off rate between the ages of 11 and 14 for girls wow. getting involved. And, and we 
we definitely are, you know, leaning towards it's probably lining up with puberty, it's lining up with hormones, sure. but it's also lining up with that's when you want to fit into a specific group. That's when you want to be seen in a specific way. Um, and that's when you really care about your your persona and and how people perceive you. Yeah. So how do we make it so girls still want to be perceived as the smart girl, the nerdy girl, the girl who likes esports, the girl who likes gaming? And, and how do we normalize that? So creating that representation is also incredibly powerful. So when we have these groups at high schools and it's... Um, I know there's an anime group at my son's high school and it's almost like weird when a girl joins, it's like awkward. So how do we create a space where they're welcome to join these groups where they can be part of the gaming groups? Uh, so I actually recently spoke at a uh, high school talking about just the opportunity that there is in, in bringing more girls in and showing that representation. And we brought in some women who are in esports and said, this awesome. is someone who is a professional woman who is in esports, who's done the thing, who has a successful career, showing that representation, creating that space is one of the most powerful things you can do specifically in K-12 because there's such an influence in I see myself in a successful career as this person. Um, I can see myself in this space. And that's one of the biggest things that we're seeing speaks to a lot of K-12 um, individuals. And so how do we maintain that conversation of it's not just a boys sport? Um, how do we maintain that conversation of you can be successful? And then uh, speaking to kind of like what you're saying, you know, when you give silly titles or when you when you tell your parents, I want to play video games or I want to be a YouTube star, uh, they might kind of put that down. So how do we also maintain that conversation that this is a real career with the parents? And so having that parent involvement, having those conversations, there's a lot of great nonprofits that will do that. There's also a lot of just great conversations, but how can we do that at a school level? How can we do that at education level? And so when we have a basketball tournament and we have a cheerleading camp, why can't we have an esports camp? Mm. Why can't we have that same conversation with parents and, and let them know? And a lot of times technology is the barrier. So partnering schools with local facilities has been one of the most powerful things that we've seen um, to kind of work and to create that conversation. And then having those panels where the parents also show up so the parent can see the child in that successful role and creating that representation for the parent has also been uh, really, really key. All right, Tricia, I think we need to go to our keynote in July. I would love to. Yeah, I, it, it sounds like I have no doubt it's going to be an amazing keynote. And I'm just so happy to hear too that, you know, you're, you're getting into schools and, and you're talking to students, you're talking to teachers, because I think the, that representation piece is one part of it. The having folks who believe that you have the capacity, like they can see your future before you can see it is so powerful. Um, and that's, you know, listeners will be sure to have the, the link to, uh, Joni's organization, Women in Games International, that link there, because you can go and see what they're doing. And I love the emphasis that you have on mentorship. I think anyone we've had on the program who's talked about their journey into their career, they often talk about, you know, that one person that helped them out. So teachers, I think, will be listening and are going to be fired up to, yeah, I maybe need to learn more about the esports industry, or I have that student who's really passionate about games, and how can I help them make the connection with that interest, that passion, and other careers? So for our listeners who are thinking, I want to either know more about the opportunities, or I want to know more about maybe where the industry is headed, or, you know, you've also talked about skills. I love that, that it's seemingly simple, but actually really complex. How do you introduce yourself in a professional yeah, manner? So huge. And how do you rehearse that so many times that, you know, because you're right. The reality is if you're introducing yourself in a high stakes moment where you know I have to make a good impression, it's so hard to do. So you need somebody to, to practice and rehearse that with you. Um, you know, in, in closing, what what other advice would you leave for the the K twelve educator community? So that again, we we really do take advantage of. Here's an industry that's booming, that as you have painted the picture, is a community that's really seeking to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. And you know, students I know that have been engaged in esports, I one hundred percent agree with you. They talk about that collaboration piece, the community. And the community yeah. and that's, you know, belonging really matters. There's a lot of research that says so like true. that matters to us even more than food does in certain ways. Um, so, uh, you know, again, just leaving kind of the last word to you, what else could we be doing to learn, support, uh, be better aware of, of where this industry is going next? 
I think you really hit the nail on the head with community. Um, and that's so, so powerful. And, you know, when I was first getting into esports, and even when I did my capstone project for my master's program, I was really trying to e uh, research esports just on a global scale and, and really see who are the people who are buying the things, who are the people who are really influencing the market, and, and what does that look like uh, across the world? And uh, it was really difficult to find women in that space. And it, it was, a, you know, a piece that was partially because it was almost like what do you mean you're into esports and then you had to prove like do you even game bro kind of a thing uh and so being able to answer like crazy questions just to try to try to you know prove that you were actually into esports um was was really a big thing uh and now it's to the point that we have women's only tournaments we have women's only teams and we have there's so much more representation and it's just constantly building and evolving on that community so um community is the number one thing i i definitely really empower people to do reach out to these esports teams reach out to these esports professionals reach out there's so many women that want to continue that conversation mm. that want to you know talk about their struggles but also their triumphs and they really want to show that opportunity and they want to be that for somebody else because I didn't have that. I didn't have, you know, um, somebody that I could look up to or a woman executive that, you know, could say, well, I've been in esports for so many years because esports was still starting out. So it was that opportunity to, um, to really have those conversations and to create that representation, but also to build that community so that you know who you can reach out to when you do have a question and making sure it's somebody that you can trust when you reach out to. Um, the other thing for me is is research. I love a good book. I will listen to a book. Uh, I will read a book. I will, whatever it is, I love to take notes. I love to highlight things. I love, to, I love that data aspect and mm -hmm. I love being able to have facts to back up the things that I'm doing. So um, T.L. Taylor is an amazing author. She has been within the industry for years and years and years and has just written about so many different aspects of esports and gaming. Um, she, she's a facilitator at, uh, she was at Stanford and MIT and the Copenhagen School of Business. Um, she's also a uh, head of a nonprofit. Um, and, and there's just such a huge wealth of knowledge that comes from her that in these books that she's writing, you can check out Amazon, just look up T.L. Taylor. Um, and it, it's there's so much learning and there's so much impact, but there's, there's such a really a cool sort of shift in esports and gaming and, and sort of toxic behaviors and, um, and Gamergate and then kind of evolving mm. until now. And so seeing that evolution is actually really, really powerful because you can sort of see where we came from as well as where we're going and how to continue to propel, propel that forward in a really positive way. Um, our programming is really focused on professional development. And so we have a lot of really great resources. Um, our mission is actually to provide resources to advance economic equality and diversity and the esports tabletop and video game industry. Awesome. And so our resources are all free to access and that includes our programming and that includes we're working on a few white pages right now we're working on a few case studies we're trying to do just as much research as we can to really pull in that data and pull in those stats but when you're having a conversation with somebody in k-12 they don't really care about stats necessarily i think uh especially when you're trying to really speak to those kids uh so having the teachers that know the stats i think is how you're going to be able to speak to the parents mm. but having the conversations about the storytelling and the empathy and the building and and what that can look like and the future possibilities, I think is going to be what really resonates more with the kids. So sort of having that wealth of knowledge, but also having those resources and saying, wow, it's a really great question. Here's a book. Go go check this out and tell me what you think. Mm. Let, let you think and have your own opinions. Let them form their own ideas. And that's going to be the person that changes the next five, 10 years of the industry. So um, creating that opportunity for learning, I think, is one of the biggest pieces that we've seen for success right now is I'm not going to tell you what to think. I'm going to tell you where to find resources. And then I want you to come back and tell me what you think. Uh, and, and that's been creating a lot of really positive conversations. Um, all of our programs are really based on the idea of, I wish I had known X at Y stage of my career. And, and how would that have completely transformed my career trajectory? And then creating those cheat codes, creating those, those panels or those workshops to teach that cheat code to the next generation so that you don't have to go through that thing that I had to go through because now you know how exactly how to deal with it. Um, so one of the biggest things we talk about is actionable allyship as well. So um, having an opportunity when you see something, say something is, is something that people will repeat all the time. But who, who do you say it to? And what do you say? And how do you approach it? And how do you approach it without being performative? And so we have a lot of workshops and just um, resources driven around actionable allyship and how to truly stand up for yourself and for others and, and creating that space. And I think that's a huge piece as well within esports um, is just creating that that continued conversation of 
I don't like that, but how do I change it without trying to change a mind? I'm just going to change the way we approach the entire topic or, or subject. Um, so that's, that's sort of been a huge thing. You know, Trisha, as she's talking, the only thing that's going through my head is we know right now, a lot of schools are heavily focused on DEI work. Yeah. And what if, what if esports is one of those avenues where you can start an esports team in your school and talk about inclusivity and equity and diversity from the beginning and talk about how it has to involve everybody and how do you talk to everybody and what does that mean? You know, so often, even still today in, in sports, you know, we've got the boys basketball team and the girls basketball team and the, you know, girls volleyball team. And we've got, we, we separate everything. And here you've got a sport <laughs> where we don't care. We care about the community. We care about being together. We care about, of course, winning, but we also care about just producing a product because you're live streaming on Twitch and all the stuff that happens behind the, behind the scenes, right? We're creating a community that is supporting each other and doing what we love. And what if, Esports can be that for your school in your talks about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I think I also was just thinking as you were speaking, often students will be interested in the world of nonprofit work. And I'm thinking your organization is another great example to point them to just, you know, for all of the schools that do have a world of work program or, you know, they bring in a panel to speak about their careers. I think Joni, you've really pushed us to make sure we're, what are we doing with those opportunities to make sure that all students are seeing you know, futures that they are interested in are, that are relevant to things that they care about. And also that we are not necessarily just replicating stereotypes, right? You know, what are we doing to really make sure that a student leaves a world of work experience or a panel like that thinking, wow, I may never before have thought I could. And now I think maybe I can, like, I just think there's such power in that. So um, we hope that maybe we'll get to see some aspects of your keynote, like yeah, via YouTube sure. or something. Uh, looking forward to hearing more about that and continuing to see the work that you do with Women in Games International. All of those links will be in the show notes. Um, you mentioned that you do connect with K-12 schools. If someone is listening and thinking, oh, I would love to bring Joni virtually to my school or in person to my school, how can they connect with you? Yeah, um, so everything is GetWiggy. So we are GetWiggy.com. We're GetWiggy on all social media. Um, and then my email is just Joni at GetWiggy.com. So please reach out. We are always excited to create new conversations and opportunities. I really think COVID showed us that we can do so much virtually and still yeah. make a really, really powerful impact. So um, there's, you know, we're meeting with um, schools in different countries at 6 a.m. And that's totally fine. And uh, we're meeting with domestic schools as well and just kind of having those conversations. So, um, yeah, absolutely. I would love to 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 work with anybody or to make a suggestion. We also have a really strong no woman, no panel initiative. So we won't support a conference that doesn't have at least 50% um, gender um, diversity. And so uh, I, I know a lot of people too that are willing to speak and, and are interested in, in continuing that conversation as well. So uh, it doesn't have to be me, but if you're interested in getting an introduction, uh, just let me know and uh, we can also continue that for sure. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much for giving up some of your time. Joni, the CEO of Women in Games International. We appreciate you being here on Shifting Schools and uh, we can we are excited to continue to follow. And if there's anything we can do to support too, please do let us know. Uh, again, this is an industry that I think is, is already impacting K-12 and I think is going to continue uh, to impact K-12 going forward. And I think we have to get in front of it or at least start to embrace it. If nothing else, let's just start by embracing it in our schools, the cultures and communities that these kids have already created and how do we use those to foster the work and create uh, the, the people we want in the world. So thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll chat again later. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>